There you go. So thank you very much for turning up, folks. And and if you didn't get an opportunity to turn up, um, I'd like to uh, say I hope that you enjoyed the recording. Let me share my screen, which I think, even though I'm kind of already doing it, but I think this might record a little bit better if we do it this way. Yeah, I think it will. So thank you very much. As I said, um, this is a, a session that I just want to share some insights with you. And, and I know the people that are here right now are well and truly across the new psychosocial hazards legislation. But there are some that are registered that won't be. And some people then who are watching this might not be completely across it. So I'll dive through a very quick overview of what the new psychosocial uh, hazards legislation is going to mean for organizations. And we had we had a wide range of people who were going to turn up today. So uh, from different sort of industries and, and sectors, if you like. So it's probably a good idea for us to just talk through it all. Um, I'll, I'll be then sharing a strategy with you that I use to sort of lift leaders to see not an obligation, but an opportunity in, in the new sort of process moving forward and the new legislation. And so at the end, I'll speak to a solution. I don't want to ambush you with a sales pitch. You're not going to be pitch slapped, but there will be a conversation about a program, that an introductory sort of coaching program for leaders that I offer that will help us shift from that oblig seeing it as an obligation to an opportunity so um very quickly uh sort of an over the treetops look the, le the legislation changes and why we need to be aware of it for compliance uh, a lot of um mid-layer b-suite kind of leaders uh, the ones who who lead people and are in direct contact with people all day every day are the ones that this will this whole sort of process will hinge on and and sort of live or die by really and and but and so many of them are seeing it as just more red tape another obligation they need to address uh, and some are even actually kind of thinking we might ignore it and it might go away um which probably isn't the smartest move and 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 the reason for the legislation change is because mental health workers' compensation claims are increasing, both in duration and in the cost per sort of claim, if you like, which is what brought about the, the legislation change. So there's new uh, international standards, ISO 45003, and, and it speaks to mental health in the workplace, and it speaks to this new legislation that Australia is the first country to jump on, but it's an international standard, so it's going to go everywhere. Fundamentally, in 25 words or less, if I can, the changes are um, there's a shift now from sort of treating um, the serious issues as being reckless. So in other words, we're aware of substantial risk and deliberately do not take action against it. And we've shifted that or the legislation has shifted that now to just gross negligence. So in other words, doing or failing to do what a reasonable person would have done. That's quite a big shift. Uh, it's a bit like dangerous driving versus negligent driving if you were getting a sort of a, a, a ticket from the highway patrol or something like that. The other thing that's shifted there is the evidentiary burden. So in other words, the burden is no longer on the prosecution to prove that you've been reckless. They only have to demonstrate that you've been negligent. And so then it's up to us to sort of demonstrate why we fi fail to take action. Um for officers of the organization, or if it's a small business or a sole trader, it's the person who controls the business or undertaking, PCBU. Uh, we have to be able to show tangible evidence of exercising due diligence. So in other words, that we can verify the use and provision of resources and processes. So it's not it's no good to say that we, we drive well. We need to show our driver's license as well. And and. They've, they've sort of changed some of the definitions on, on top of that as well. So that's basically why we need to sit up and take notice. And, and I draw a sort of a, a tangible, a, sort of a tangent or a line between cybersecurity issues of a couple of years ago and Optus were in the, in the news again today as a result of that failure. Nobody was investing in security and we were throwing our hands up if something happened and reacting after the event saying we didn't know. And there's a legal term that that people, legislators, um, prosecutors, and and the legal uh, 
people involved in the new psychosocial hazards legislation talk about reasonable mistake of fact has no application here anymore. So for us to say we didn't know is no longer a defense. We should have known, which all talks about why we need to actually start tapping into being proactive in, 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 in the whole sort of process. Now, let me just get out of your way a little bit here. If I do that. So we're talking about risk to the organization, risk to the individuals, risk to team leaders, risk to the reputation of the business, etc. And and when we look at risk as a sort of a, a financial concept, we need to talk about the cost of being wrong, or in other words, or in this case, sometimes the cost of doing nothing is far greater than, you know, uh, tackling and becoming compliant with the legislation. So there's an expected value of additional information which is required, and that's a kind of a no-brainer. If we seek the information that could cause us harm, in other words, um, we, we identify the hazards and assess the risks and, and control the outcomes, which is what the legislation is about. If we um, seek the additional information for that, then the cost of doing that is far, great, far less than the cost of not doing anything. Just a heads up, there are some businesses I've been speaking to in the last six months have had kind of excuses like, We've looked at the legislation and it doesn't really apply to us. And I go, no, it, it applies to everybody. And if you feel it doesn't apply to you, you're probably going to be even more exposed than somebody who isn't. Um, somebody else said, yeah, look, we, we're, we've we've looked at it and we've changed our bullying sort of process. So I think we're all good. And yeah, That's one of a number of uh, issues that you need to be aware of when it comes to mental health. Safe Work and, and Safe Work Australia, etc., are saying that bullying is the number one mental health challenge in the workplace. And and I their research says that, but they're researching workers' compensation claims only. And so I have a bit of an issue with that. My experience and everything I'm reading in, in ongoing research and in 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 sort of uh uh, what do you call it, uh, organizations that are sort of exploring what the challenges are in the workplace today. Burnout comes to number one all the time. And I think what's happening is the workers' compensation sort of uh, statistics are showing bullying. People are laying sort of workers' compensation claims because of feeling bullied or victimized or whatever. If somebody's burning out, they're actually leaving the organization earlier and they're probably not making a workers' compensation claim. So the experience I have and what I'm hearing whenever I speak to people leaders is that burnout's their biggest challenge by far and away. So, so bullying seems to be the one that's got the focus, but I think burnout is actually the bigger problem. Um, somebody else said to me, Look, we think it's better to not have a policy than to have one and not stick to it. And again, no, it's your license expiring is, is not as bad as driving without, you know, never having had a license, if you like. Um, so I think there's there's a sort of a misconception that will shift when we see the response from WorkSafe Victoria or Safe Work Australia, or Safe Work New South Wales, or or any of the other sort of state level ones. So that's it uh in a nutshell. Um that's the legislation and the kind of responses to risk, et cetera. So in short, what's happening is there's a new set of regulations. We need a policy that addresses the regulations. We need a strategy to deliver on our policy. And we need clear actionables that the people that are affected by it and the people that are going to drive this can actually deliver on it. Uh, the other sort of change with the legislation says we have to be in a preventive space now. So, you know, we can't say we didn't know anymore and respond after the event. We should have known. So therefore, we got to be out in front. And so we have to, by law now, we have to collaborate at all levels of the organization. All levels of the workforce have to have a say in how we identify. Where's my little pointer here? have a say in how we identify the hazards in that workplace. We have to, um, welcome, Marigan. We have to, um, on identifying all of the hazards, we have to be able to assess the risks and the likelihood of them occurring in, in each of our different sort of areas. 
So, so that takes quite a bit of thinking and quite a bit of collaboration and talking in order to set the policy and strategy that we're going to follow. We have to control the risks and outcomes, which means we need to upskill our leaders and we have to educate and collaborate with everybody continually. But our people leaders have to know how to be good at this. And this is where this idea of an obligation, reframing that into a um, into an opportunity, I think. And then the fourth uh, element of this is, again, we have to continually review and monitor. And my conversations with legislators and my conversations with prosecutors and the legal people uh, are basically saying we need to be able to show evidence that if something happens, it's not that we get slapped down for it, but we have to show that we've learned from what's actually occurred and we're, we're amending our strategy and our policy to ensure that we're covering all of that. So in short, we need to involve everyone in the in the consultation process at all levels. We have to collaborate and identify the hazards and risks arising from work and making the decisions about ways to eliminate or minimize those risks. You can see why people leaders are starting to see this as, you know, just more stuff that I'm going to have to do. And, and in actual fact, I reckon um, that... Our response, both to the legislation and our response to uh, burnout as 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 the the number one issue that I believe it is the number one issue in the workplace, will center around this is like uh, will center around those people leaders, those sort of middle managers, and and or you know depending on the terminology used in your workplace, we could be talking about, um, we could be talking about. Uh, Supervisors, team hands, leading hands, um, uh, area managers, you know, floor managers, that anyone that's working continually with people are the ones that are going to be the choke point or the trigger point for all of this. And, and this sort of image or this model behind my head here is kind of like the bow tie model, which is a common enough one when we're talking about risk and work health and safety. But it's the same thing, identifying the hazards, assessing the risks and controlling the outcomes will center on the actions and activities of our people leaders. And then the outcomes, obviously, and renewing, reviewing and monitoring are all of the things that need to occur. And I'll talk in a moment about, you know, the value of doing that and how we need to sort of change the mindset of our people leaders to look at this as something that's valuable to them because we can improve in performance engagement, teamwork, belonging and cohesion uh, across their teams without a huge amount of effort. But something has been challenging people leaders traditionally in this space around mental health. So we're talking, on one level, we're talking about the sort of stigma that people uh, experience around their mental health. And, and pre-COVID, that was quite a... a sizable thing but but since then a lot has happened since the whole idea of changing how we work and, and changing you know the, the way we work and, and where we work etc uh, has has shifted the mindset around talking about mental health in the workplace but we've been avoiding the conversation um, and we can no longer do that with this new legislation but the conversation I like to have with people leaders is, look, this seems bigger than it is. Uh, the way I just described it there, that sounds like it's a minefield, but it, it's not really, it's not that difficult. And it's more important than they give it sort of credence for. But with any of the stats that you're seeing behind my head here, I think the most important one is two out of three leaders of people continue to avoid the conversations around mental health. Now, what's interesting about that is other research says that three out of four leaders reckon that their people know they can come to them and talk to them about any problem that they've got. So that's three out of four leaders think that's what's happening. One out of four of our work people, of our workforce, think that that's the case. So that's a massive gap between the two. And, and as I said earlier on, um, even though bullying is, is kind of given the most uh, sort of airtime, I reckon employees that are experiencing burnout are 3.4 times more likely to go look for another job. And, and it's a space that they will sit in because of the sort of effects that it has on them and the sort of sense of 
you know, I'm not good enough and I can't keep up with the team, etc. And and leaders are, are not addressing it when they're seeing it because there's a number of reasons, actually. Um, leaders feel like um, they're going to say the wrong thing. They're going to feel like, uh, what if I say something and they become a burden? What if I give them some advice and it's wrong and it all goes pear-shaped, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a number of reasons why leaders won't speak up and then there's actually that's you know the, the, the two out of three leaders sorry yeah about yeah about 60 60 something percent of leaders won't actually speak up and 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 then the ones that do often do it sort of clumsily and not in a sort of a, a, a supportive and clever way and there's something about burnout in the in the terminology and in the language that we talk about in the workplace that i just want to touch off for a moment this is the World Health Organization uh, definition of what burnout is. And it follows Christine Maslach and, and Michael Leiter's sort of research into it back in the 80s. Um, and, and actually, it even began earlier than that. But they sort of summed it all up as to being three sort of dimensions to burnout in the workplace. Exhaustion. We kind of get that mental, physical or emotional what they called efficacy, and it's really our effectiveness and, and sort of the work quality that we deliver and, and sort of our ability to sort of do our best work, if you like, um, is affected. And then this, this third area they talk about is cynicism. It's that kind of mental distance or jadedness that we get, and we become disengaged as a result of our, uh, the burnout that we're experiencing. The interesting point with this, and, and as you're looking at that, I've come from a mental health background and, and something was always niggling me with this, that there was no mention of mental ill health or, 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 or any kind of a mental disorder as a result of our burnout ever appeared in any of the sort of definitions. So I've changed it a bit and, and I'm in good company because Gordon Parker is a professor emeritus at University of New South Wales with some of his colleagues wrote a fabulous book that's out there in the last few years on burnout. And they've highlighted a number of issues that occur with burnout. Um, so it sort of lines up with where I think it, it goes. And in my opinion, exhaustion, yes, of course, that's still there. Efficacy, I think, is a sort of an academic word and it, it's not in the common language. I think our ability to do our best work, you know, uh, drops back. So and, and so we get brain fog, et cetera, things like that. We get um, apathy, I think, is a very different sort of uh, approach to cynicism. If you look at the old model, cynicism is actually a coping strategy for the burnout that we're feeling. And what it says is that we're feeling disconnected and disengaged. And, and, and as a result, um, it's a lonely, awful place to be. So very often what we will do is we will try to recruit other people into that space with us. So we office gossip starts and they'll people will gossip about leaders, about peers, about the team, about the organization, or, or worst of all, about the clients and the, and the customers that we sort of service. And that cynicism is an outward expression. Um, I've worked in the addiction space for a great many years. And when people relapse in the early stages of addiction, they will always have a story that blames everything and everybody around them for the set of circumstances that caused them to relapse. And cynicism, to my mind, is a little bit like that. It's always somebody else's or something else's fault. But when I approach burnout, I see it as apathy. And it's a case of we've just run out of steam. We don't have the energy to sort of keep going with it anymore. And the result of being in that space Instead of trying to recruit other people in with us through gossip, etc., we'll reach a point where we're experiencing, you know, anguish or or what I call affect disorders, emotional responses to external stimuli. But basically, what that is is it's chronic stress causes mental health disorders, and and this is why I think leaders need to be across this and need to be better able to have a conversation with their people around their burnout. Because very often the burnout that they're experiencing is work-related, mostly work-related, which is an organizational problem, not an individual problem. It's the workload, the lack of clarity, the uh, overwhelming sort of deadlines, et cetera. That's what causes the burnout. 
So that can be addressed. It's a it's an organizational workload issue <clears throat> rather than an actual person issue. But the thing that stops our leaders from reaching out and supporting people is this fear, as I said earlier, they're going to get this wrong. They're going to say the wrong thing. They're going to uh, give bad advice. They're going to, you know, they don't know what to say. They don't know what advice to give. Um, and they're afraid the person will become a burden on them. And, and it's kind of a myth that doesn't really happen. So when I'm coaching teams um, of people leaders, I go to great pains to explain to them that you don't have to rescue or save anybody. In actual fact, there's there's 80 years of research that says you don't have to. And I'm going to share it with you here very quickly. I spend a lot more time on this with, with uh, people leaders. 40% of the likelihood of somebody in your team recovering from their mental health challenge is based around the community support that they experience. So from family, friends, colleagues, leaders, workplace. 30% of the likelihood of them recovering, you probably can't see that writing, it's fairly small, but I'll walk you through it. 30% of the likelihood of somebody recovering from a mental health challenge in the workplace is based around the sense of hope that they can get better, which is going to be influenced by that 40%, of course. The remaining 30% is broken down between about half and half the therapeutic relationship that they develop with their primary carer, their GP, their counselor, their psychologist, psychiatrist, whoever it is. And then the, 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 the final 15% is based on the sort of treatment method or modality that they get to treat their, their mental health challenge. Now, if I, if I was had time with your leaders, I would probably start this by asking a question, what element, how much do you think the treatment they receive is responsible for the recovery? And almost always the answer I get is about 80%. But in actual fact, it's about 15 And when I explain to people leaders that you can influence as much as 70% of the likelihood of somebody recovering from whatever challenge it is they're experiencing to their mental health without ever rescuing or saving anybody, all you're doing is creating a, a place of safety. And, and you do that by inquiring how we can support people and empowering them into actually the recovery sort of process themselves. So when, when leaders hear that, they go, okay, well, it's not as hard as it sounds. And they go, no, no, but you still have to know what to do, what to do and what to say and when to say it. And that's not difficult when you know how. And there are, there are, in my mind, there are probably four sort of currencies, if you like, that will motivate leaders of people to want to do this and want to be better at this. And, and the, so the four currencies are, well, first of all, a leader is motivated by money. And in this case, an empathetic, caring leader has gotten far greater value to the organization. It's valued at about 40,000 Australian dollars. That's from Tra Travis Bradbury's research. Status, reputation of being a good leader and a caring leader, etc. That's vastly increased when people feel that they can trust their leader. Uh, being better at this saves time, uh, reduction in absenteeism and presenteeism, etc. And then the other motivator is kind of happiness, contentedness, team connection, if you like. So every leader wants to lead a winning team and every team wants a trusting and caring leader. And what I've discovered in, in doing this work, even before the psychosocial hazards legislation, um, this I'm just going to get out of your way here for this one. It's quite big. But certainly since the, you know, we need to be compliant with the new legislation, what we're finding is organizations and leaders completely blissfully unaware that some work was needed on this. They were sort of clueless to it. Um, and as they sort of became aware of it, uh, as I said earlier, there's sometimes there's a sense that this is bigger than uh, you know than it seems, or it seems to be huge, and it's actually not as as kind of scary as it as it might sort of appear. So we get people over this sort of tipping line, if you like, they, they become aware of it. And, ah, okay, we need to do something about this. And as we upskill them and shift and reframe from this thing being a whole, just this is an obligation or another task I have to do. When they get competent at being this kind of a caring trusting leader and they, 
we reach compliance. It's it's actually, it's pretty quick. The leaders become sort of more comfortable in it and confident in having the conversations. But once we become compliant, the leaders' skill sets have risen to such a, uh, an extent that they're well above this tipping line and they're moving from cautious to comfortable. And as they get better and we sort of practice skills, et cetera, they become very confident at it. And what we've seen that happens with teams organically through the compliance process or even through upskilling our leaders to be better leaders, we're finding that teams move from sort of, you know, below the line here where they're completely disregarded and, dis, you know, disrespected and, and completely missed, in fact, to when they're being heard and seen and they feel like this, they start to feel like they belong to something, which is very different to fitting in. And in fact, I saw some really interesting research during the week that said being heard or being seen in a situation like that is so close to being loved in, in how it actually motivates us and how we respond to it. It's really important. And what you'll find when we're following a process of, first of all, being compliant, but then second of all, leaders developing their skills, that the culture in an organization very quickly moves from being troublesome or toxic and starts turning and transforming. And suddenly we have a thriving culture in the organization as a result of all of this. And if you stop and look at leaders upskilling, changing the culture, the culture then has a flow on effect that it takes it all the way back down here as well. So that a thriving culture means that teams feel like they belong and that they matter and they look out for each other and they have a leader that they can trust and care about. You're almost compliant in that circumstance anyway so you kind of flow from you kind of flow from this one all the way up to here and then it actually kind of keeps flowing backwards as well and the result of all of that is happy teams and happy leaders and reductions in absenteeism and presenteeism reductions in workers compensation claims earlier intervention for problems that occur but in that prevention space we find that it's a much much deeper result so at the risk of pitch slapping you, as I did say, Emily, you you might have missed it at the start. I did say that I was going to talk about a, a sort of short introductory program that I offer for organizations to sort of get the, it's a kind of an, a coaching program, to get their leaders thinking that this is not an obligation, well, compliance is, but their role in this actually gives them the opportunity to become caring and trusted leaders and, and have a team that feels like they belong and that they trust and they, they, their leader is kind of got their back, if you like, and how that changes and transforms the culture. So that program, um, how it looks today is it's, I ask you for three hours with your leadership team, two hour masterclass where we cover in, in sort of greater detail what I'm talking about here. Um, it doesn't have too much. In, you can't do a lot in two hours to sort of shift people's skills. But what we do is open their eyes and raise their awareness to the fact that there is a better, more lucrative, more valuable way of increasing connection and performance and you know, developing a leading team. So we do a two-hour masterclass to shift them from obligation to uh, seeing this as an opportunity. We follow that up with a one-hour group coaching sort of pro session to see what's working and what's not. And we can do this in-house or we can do it online. So if your leaders are spread all over the country, you don't want to bring them all into to one place for two-hour masterclass. But if they're all in, you know, roughly the same sort of place, we can do this as a two-hour sort of session, if you like. Not massively skills based. We do a little a few breakout rooms uh, to sort of practice a couple of things. But um, as a sort of a, as a way of introducing your leaders into the possibility and potential of all this, this is a it's a five thousand dollar program. So what I'm going to suggest and I'm going to put anybody on the spot and let me get out of your way here for a second. If you're interested in having a conversation with me about this or about anything else that that I do. Jump on the QR code and that will take you to a, a, just a quick questionnaire where you can just fill in your details. Tell me what you're interested in. Tell me what you want to have a conversation about. And if this program of just raising and lifting the awareness of your leaders into how by being compliant, we can be all of these other things like sort of trusting and caring leaders, etc. Uh, we can do that. So I'm going to switch this off in five. 
four, three, two, one. And I'm back. So thank you very much for your time. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop recording. And uh, if you've got any questions that you folks want to ask, uh, we can we can certainly uh, accommodate that.